So a few days ago, the popular history YouTuber Lindy Beige uploaded a video entitled The History Pedant's Guide to the Last Kingdom, in which he points out several of the historical and logical inaccuracies in the first episode of the BBC's new drama series The Last Kingdom, which is set in the Dark Ages, sort of Viking invasion era uh, in Britain. Now, first of all, I have to say that I agreed with the vast majority of what he said, but there were a few things that I didn't agree with and I thought maybe there were some other explanations for that he might not have thought about, so I'd like to put them forward in this response video. Uh, I'd like to say that I'm a massive fan of Lindy Beige's channel. Uh, I, I enjoy his content, I love history, so I really like his stuff, and this video isn't meant to discredit him, it's simply to give another point of view, uh, my point of view, on some of the things he said. So, um, first of all, he makes the point that Uhtred's father is calling the men in the longships Danes and then calling them Vikings, which he doesn't like very much. So, uh, however, if you listen carefully to what he says, you'll hear that he doesn't call them Vikings, but he says they come as Vikings. Uhtred asks, are they traders? And his father replies, no, they come as Vikings. Now, to understand why he says they come as Vikings, we have to look at the etymology of the word Viking. The word Viking comes from the Old Norse word Vikingr, which is thought to be made up of the Old Norse or Old English word for a bay or an inlet, which was wick or fik, depending on which language it was in. This would mean that a Vikingr is someone who comes from or has an association with a bay or an inlet, or, in other terms, large bodies of water, so a seafarer. In Old Norse, the meaning of Vikingr was a person who might go travelling over water, a raider, a seafarer, or a plunderer. A possible word that has the same meaning in modern English could be pirate, even though today it has different connotations. In modern times, everyone living in Scandinavia from about the period that is the end of the Western Roman Empire until 1066 is called a Viking. However, these early medieval Scandinavians did not call themselves Vikings. In Old Norse culture, a person could go Viking, which meant to take a ship and over a dozen men abroad and plunder a settlement before returning home with their goods. So when Uhtred's father says they come as Vikings, he means they are Danes, as he previously called them, whose intent on his land is to raid and to pillage. A quick note on the word Dane being used. Now today we call people from Denmark, Norway and Sweden Danes, Norwegians, and Swedes. However, in the 9th century, the Anglo-Saxons didn't distinguish between different Scandinavian peoples, and named all those of Nordic origin Dane, even if they were from Sweden or Norway. In this case, Uhtred's father is correct. The army that came from the North Sea to England in 866 AD was Danish, led by Ivar the Bonus, one of the sons of the legendary Ragnar Lothbrok. But how, at a glance, can Uhtred's father know that they've come to raid? Uhtred asks if they are traders because Scandinavians had been crossing the North Sea in search of commerce hundreds of years before they came in longships to plunder. The ships the Northmen are in are clearly longships, which were very different to the vessels they used fitting with the English. Let me explain. The Northmen had two main types of ships, one for raiding and fighting, the other for trading and commuting. The most famous Viking ship is of course the longship called Drakar in Old Norse, they were called dragon boats because of the beast heads that they had attached to their prows. A Drakar could be one of four classes, a Bussa type ship, a Snekje type ship, a Sekte type ship, or a Karv type ship. All of these types shared the same traits that made them so deadly in the hands of the early coastal raiders. First of all, they are very low in the water. They have shallow draft holes so that they can sail up rivers and in shallower water. Secondly, they are narrow so that they can sail further inland on smaller rivers. They are very fast, enabling the crew to sail to a target, attack it, and sail home again before an enemy knew what was happening. The crews were large. Some larger Bursa-type ships may have had up to 200 men aboard one vessel. On the other hand, merchant ships, or Knarr, were broader in build, and built deeper so that they could carry more cargo. The crew of a Knarr could be as small as half a dozen men, as the, le as the less men on board, the more room for cargo. Now, another point Lindy Beige makes several times in his video is that the king, aka Uhtred's father, is not a very kingly in manner of dress, housing or furniture, among other things. To understand why this is, we need to delve into the politics and the power struggles of 9th century Northumbria. 
This is a map of Northumbria. Well, the bit in yellow is at least. Debenbur is roughly there on the main next to the island of Lindisfarne. Otherwise known as Holy Island, it is famous for being the, f the site of the first Viking raid on a monastery, when a band of Norwegian Vikings took it upon themselves to burn it to the ground, steal all the plunder, and take away the monks as slaves in the year AD 793. Since that date, the Kingdom of Northumbria was rocked with mishap and mayhem. As you can see, King Ela takes the throne last in 862 AD and rules in a relative amount of peace for four years. However, he is seen as a massive tyrant and the person he deposed, King Osbert, was seen as the rightful king so it was looked down upon by people at the time. However, when the Viking army sacks Eärfowich, modern day York, he asks the deposed King Osbert to join his army and lead his men against the invader. But then, who is Uhtred's father supposed to be? There are three kings in this picture. There's King Ela, King Osbert, and that other guy. Is, is he a lord, a king, a reeve, completely made up? Answers. We need answers. Because of over half a century's worth of war, bad harvests, and Viking raids, the kings and lords of Northumbria are left feeling suspicious, weakened, and poor. This also means that they might not have enough money to spend on comfy chairs, flashy jewellery, and fancy palaces, but will have to make do with crappy stools, insect-filled amber, and dank cities. Now, onto the point he made about there being a lot of crosses on the Viking shields. In the 9th century, the Vikings were pretty much all pagans. That, that is correct. However, a cross design has been around a lot longer than Christ and his connotation with it. On the website of Regia Angolorum, a historical reenacting society that specifically deals with the Dark Ages and the Viking presence in the British Isles, says uh, on shields that they were painted a single colour, although some have a design painted onto them. The commonest designs are simple crosses or derivations of sun wheels or segments. And we, here we have an example of a Viking shield wall. On Viking shields, they would have had pictures of the gods, pictures of things related to gods. For example, if their chief deity was Odin, which was the chief deity of most Vikings, they would have things like wolves, ravens, uh, his one eye, you know, things that represented him. Or for Thor, they might have had Mjolnir, his hammer, or for Frey, maybe a boar, that kind of thing. So it was very symbolic for the god of war, Tyr. They might have had a Tiwa's rune which in Nordic runic script in Nordic runic script which is hard to say now moving on to the Northumbrian shields he's absolutely right when he says that they wouldn't have had rectangular shields and that it's a bit odd and not just a bit inaccurate they weren't Romans they were Anglo-Saxons they would have had round shields like these ones however I'm not too sure that the comment he makes about them having bare wood on the fronts uh, is incorrect for the time period now we don't know for sure it's hard when it comes to things like shields and being painted because obviously paint and wood they rot and they, they die away after time so there's no way of really finding out um, unless we find a, a specifically well preserved shield and then we've got to go back to the sources from uh, the time which weren't brilliant either however Richard Underwood's book from 1999 says, uh, called Anglo-Saxon Weapons and Warfare says that Although there is no archaeological evidence that shields in Anglo-Saxon England were painted, contemporary examples of painted shields have been found in Denmark. As he says, they were found in southern Scandinavia at the time, hence the Danes had painted shields, but there's no archaeological evidence that support Lindy's claim about the Anglo-Saxons having painted their shields. So they might have done, but for the same money they might not have done, so we just don't know really. So not, not really any way of backing that up. One of the final things Lenny Beige brings up in his video is that Leeds isn't very big and the fact is I don't think that that is Leeds or it's meant to be, I think that's meant to be one of the places around Leeds. Uh, Leeds obviously would have been a lot smaller and I think it's more likely to have been a collection of farmsteads. I did a lot of looking around but I couldn't actually find anything of significant value about the population of Leeds in the 9th century so unfortunately I can't really bring anything up with certification there but I think it's more likely to have been a collection of farmsteads on which Earl Ragnar and his warriors would have settled. And that brings me on to my next point, uh, Ragnar is an Earl, so 
um, Lindy Beige was saying that he, where are all the crops? You know, where's all the farming and things? Well, he's an earl, and in the video, if you actually quite a lot of time in the Last Kingdom, if you look, if you pause it, and you you have a look at what the people are doing in the background, they're carrying around white sacks. Now, those could be white sacks filled with wheat and grain and other things, because he is an earl, so that might be the way of sort of paying their way, paying homage to the earl, because that did happen in Viking times. People would, you know, they would swear an allegiance to an earl and perhaps help them out with that sort of thing. And for that, the earl would be responsible for sharing out the plunder and the silver that would be um, got on a Viking raid. So that, that might be why there's no crops there. However, in this little clip, if we just pause it here, then you can see that there to the left and to the right on the waterfront, though that does look a lot like wheat so that might be where the wheat is on Kjartan's farm which is his ship's master so this has been my video response to Lindy Beige's commentary on the Last Kingdom's first episode I hope you all enjoyed watching and were given a deeper insight into the life and times of Uhtred of Bebenbur and the first Viking invasion with the great heathen army of Northumbria. I hope it's been informative. Don't take everything I say as gospel. I am, you know, I, I know some about uh, some things about it, but other things, you know, I've, I've done my research. If you want the sources that I used for any of the information in this video, please ask me. I'll leave links in the description to all of that and a link in the description to Lindy Bage's video, obviously. Um, so yeah, if you enjoyed it, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe down below. Tell me what you thought of it. So until next time, this has been History with HV.